Welcome to our program. Good evening. I am Don Carlton. I'm the executive director of the Briscoe Center, where you find yourself right now. Thank you for joining us tonight uh, for this very special program. Uh, it's a conversation between Robert Polidori and Stephen Holscher. I'll ask our speakers, well, actually, that's a non-operative phrase. I was going to ask, I was going to say I was going to ask our speakers to come up after I introduce you, but we've already got our speakers up here, so we're... <laughs> the Briscoe Center is the home of the Robert Polidori Photographic Print Archive. It's a comprehensive collection of, of the photographer's work to the present day. Not quite, I don't think so. Actually, Robert, you've probably done some work since we have uh, last saw you. Consisting, but our collection consists of more than 85,000 archive prints. And when you've seen the size of Robert's prints, you know that's a lot of stuff, and uh, so, which is a lot of fun. The collection documents all of Robert's major projects and hopefully you've, uh, some of you have been able to go and look at the exhibit. If not, we're gonna have a reception afterward and we hope you go and look at the, at the exhibit. His subjects include the, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and subsequent flooding in New Orleans, the ruins of Pompeii, the Chateau de uh, Versailles, Havana, and Chernobyl. His current work deals with, in fact, I see we've been showing some of the photographs up here, his current work deals with population and urban growth through photographs of cities around the world. Polidori's work has been featured in major international exhibitions and galleries, including New Orleans after the flood at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City in 2006. He was a contributor and staff photographer for The New Yorker from 1998 until 2006. Oh, 12. I, see, it's good to have you here. You can't, you can't believe everything you read, Robert. Okay. And his work also has been featured in such publications as Vanity Fair and Architectural Digest, as well as 15 books of his work by Steidl Publishing. Individual prints of his work are held in numerous collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York, London's uh, Victoria and Albert Museum, and the Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, and the Centre Pompidou in Paris. He's been a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship uh, for photography, a World Press Award, and on two occasions, the Alfred Eisenstadt Award for Magazine Photography. Several years ago, the center launched its ambitious program to preserve the work of photojournalists and documentary photographers as important resources for historical research. We've now built a definitive and rapidly growing collection of the work of more than 75 leading photographers, totaling nearly 9 million images, constituting an extensive resource of, of visual evidence documenting American history. Our efforts in this field have attracted international attention, which is why I was contacted out of the blue by New York attorney John Pelosi, who ably represents Robert. Pelosi told me that a prominent Chicago family of photography collectors had acquired Robert Polidori's extensive print collection and he asked me if I would consider accepting the entire thing as a gift to the Briscoe Center. If you look up the word consider <laughs> in the dictionary, you'll see that the formal def definition, and as like Casey Stingle used to say, you can look it up. The formal definition is, quote, to think carefully about something typically before making a decision. It was entirely unnecessary for me to take time to consider the offer. I was already very much aware of Polidori's incredible work. Robert is one of the world's most acclaimed photographers, the best known for his meticulously detailed, large format color film photographs that capture layers of history in extraordinary detail. I knew immediately 
that his photos would be right at home in our History Research Center here on campus. Given the at-scale format and intricate details in his image, his images, his archive will provide future historians with incredibly rich source material and not even just historians, many other kinds of researchers. As John Updike wrote about Robert's photographs documenting the after effects of uh, Hurricane Katrina, quote, it is for our children and our grandchildren, for the historical record that Polidori zealously labored over many months to capture on film the aftermath of one of the most spectacular disasters on American soil in this young century. So I, inf I informed John Pelosi uh, that I didn't need to spend any time considering the proposition. The answer was an immediate yes. After the gift was arranged, I traveled to Ojai, California, where Robert has his workshop, uh, to meet him and to supervise the move of the collection to Austin. This was only two months before the onslaught of the pandemic, which obviously greatly delayed our plans for an exhibit, as well as for this program tonight. Uh, I was in Ojai during December, and uh, then we were hit with this awful pandemic uh, a couple of months later. Robert and I discussed the idea of having a program like this and an exhibit very soon after we got the collection, it, but it's been three years now. So there we go with the, the problems that we have faced. Uh, I should say also that I'm deeply grateful to the Chicago area family who wish to remain anonymous for their generous donation of Robert's collection to the center. Once we reopened, the center reopened, and as far as that goes, the university reopened. Uh, after a lengthy closure caused by the pandemic, Dr. Sarah Sonner, the center's director of exhibitions, began work on present past, the exhibit now on display in our main gallery. Sarah did a marvelous job, not only in her careful selection of the large format prints uh, on display, but also in the curation of the cases that line the exterior exhibit hall. These materials from Robert's initial Polaroids and annotated images to proofs and final prints reveals the layers of evidence contained in the collection as a whole. It's an honor to have Robert Polidori with us tonight. We're also very honored to welcome my friend, Steve Holscher the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs for UT Austin's College of Liberal Arts, and the Stiles Professor of American Studies and Geography. Steve's scholarly research interests include the history of photography, uh, North American and European urbanism, social constructions of space and place, and cultural memory. His books include Reading Magnum, which was recognized as the 2013 Photo Book of the Year by American Photo Magazine. It's quite an uh, honor. And Picturing Indians is another one, that which, which won the 2009 Wisconsin Historical Society uh, Book Award of Merit. Now, after the program to, to tonight, I invite all of you to the reception that we have uh, out in the gallery, in the hall gallery. And I hope you, as I said earlier, will take time to go and, and look at Robert's big, large prints and uh, the amazing detail. Uh, and you, you, they'll capture you and you'll stand there catching yourself, staring at all the detail in these photographs. So please join me in welcoming Robert and Steve. Thank you, Don, for that uh, very detailed and, and generous intro. Uh, I'm going to let my new friend Steve here lead me through this evening, but first I want to <laughs> thank everybody for, for coming. And I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned the thing about the pandemic because, um, yes, uh, the, the transfer of, of the print materials occurred just before 
um, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic started. And I used to get requests to, to talk about or even take photos of from various publications about the effects of COVID on my life. And, the, and nobody asked me about this anymore. Like the COVID's gone now. Um, but um, I didn't know what to say then. Uh, now I can say, well, it did two, two or three things for me. One, I realized that I've been constantly on the road for 30 or 40 years, and that sort of stopped. And the transfer of the materials, um, I don't know how to, you know, see, they say, oh, like when you die, you see your life in front of you in a few moments. I've been looking at my, my life in front of me now for two and a half years. Uh, and, and the transfer of the materials also did this. I remember when we were going through and, and taking all the negatives out and, and packing it all in. It was like, like going quickly through uh, one's life and, uh, and materials and, and photos that are long forgotten. And since then, it's like it's all sort of coming out of me. It's like uh, they, they come... Oh, remember that? Oh, re oh, God, I forgot all about that. And um, so uh, it's been, a, and a, it had a side effect because I'm not so young anymore, but I managed to stay young until 69 years old. And then when the COVID, I realized, gee, I'm not young anymore. And, then, and it brought me to another um, consciousness level. Um, I'm very grateful that um, your center exists. Thank you for not having to consider. Uh, and, and I hope that in the future, even the negatives, what I care about, can come here as well under the right sort of circumstances. So I want to, and again, I want to thank everyone for coming. And now I'm going to let Steve guide me through. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, Robert. And, and thank you, Don, for inviting me to be part of this evening. It's just such a great pleasure to be here as someone who teaches in the history of photography, who does research in the history of photography. I know what it means to have an important photographer's archive here to work with. Um, it's, what, it's one thing to look at the wonderful photographs on the wall, but it's something else, in my view, much deeper and more interesting and meaningful to try to understand the processes that went into their creation, which is what you help will help us do with your archive. Um, I mean, if I, I've admired your work for a very long time. You didn't know me, but I was a graduate student um, reading The New Yorker, um, and I'm looking at articles in the 90s, um, Versailles and its dismantled condition and ruined mansions in Cuba. Um, <laughs> Frank Sinatra's 1970s era, Palm Springs home, um, Grand Central Station. I mean, there's so many wonderful photographs that The New Yorker published. And if I'm not mistaken, you were the, the second staff photographer of The New Yorker follow, following Richard Avedon, pretty big footsteps. So every few months, I was opened up The New Yorker, which is mostly, of course, um, about words and, and wonderful illustrations. And now seeing amazing photographs. And I think one of the reasons that they spoke to me so directly is that I'm trained, as I mentioned, in geography. And your photographs have this amazing, evocative way of communicating geography, which meant so, so much to me. And I also remember, briefly before I move on to my questions for you, when I was teaching my large Introduction to American Studies lecture course. It's a course that fulfills the state legislative requirement in US history here at UT. Um, I teach it to 200 students every, it used to be every fall. Um, in the fall of 2005, I'm teaching it, and then within a week after we started the semester, Katrina hit. And I had at least a half a dozen students enter my class who came to us from Tulane. Um, and then, so we're all just trying to 
make sense of what is happening in real time. And then it was January, I guess. Yeah, January 9th when, in 2006, when The New Yorker published your portfolio on Katrina. And it, it blew my mind. Um, it came out January 6th, so I had time um, to actually put it into the syllabus for that semester. I had to quickly add a unit on New Orleans and Katrina that semester, which then I, I taught your photographs in my large lecture course for, for several years. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, as a way to help students okay. understand this amazingly horrible but profound geographical moment in our lives. So can I come in on that? Because you mentioned yes. a lot of things. Like, yes. Um, me uh, working for the New Yorker was one of those things that happened because of a fluke. Uh, it happened because I, uh, you know, I'm, well, I don't know how far to go back in time, but, uh, you know, I, I came to New York in 1969. Uh, I was a, a freshman, I was a, a, a freshman dropout from college because I had seen a, a film called Wavelength by Michael Snow and I wanted to meet these people that scene, and it was presented by Annette Michelson, who had founded the Graduate Cinema Studies Program at NYU. And, because um, um, that was a film about time, but uh, I'll skip many years, we'll get back to the, the avant-garde film scene, but then I went to Paris in 83, and then I got in, involved in, I would say 1983 is the year that I totally committed myself to photography. Um, before that, I, my camera practice was in eight millimeter and 16 millimeter film. Um, but I found that filmmaking for me, was, hey, it's expensive. And there was, there's nothing to sell. You're basically renting seats. It's a, and, I, I, and I saw all these artists who were, who were selling works. I like, I'd rather sell works. And it was, um, okay, so I went to Paris and, uh, and I just became a photographer. And one of the things that I did was to use the view camera. And, the, and, and what that meant to me was, you know, the, 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 um, the qualities of perspective control, that to, to, to render, when you use a view camera, it takes a while. You're sort of self-conscious of the image when you take it. So you, uh, you have time to reflect on many things. So it, I sort of grew into wanting to take what I would call an emblematic image rather than what in French you call an instantané, which is just a snapshot, you know, just a, an immediate, this, there's more that goes into it than, than that. You're sort of reflecting on what you're seeing in front of me and say, oh, sometimes it's like, oh, it's like this also. So then you try to get it all in there, um, like, like the word I'm saying, it's like an emblem of itself and an emblem is self-conscious of itself. Okay, but back to the New Yorker. I came to New and at an opening that I had in, in a gallery in, in, in New York, there was a woman there whose name was Elizabeth Biondi who ha was now working for the New Yorker. I got in a huge heated argument with her. We were yelling at each other and stuff. It was like, and then, um, okay, and I'm not gonna say about what topic it was, but let's say it was about Iran. This does not go any further than that because I had already been to Iran. I love the Iranian people and, uh, and I say like you know you can't you, you haven't met the people yet okay and then uh, she was working there uh, what was oh the British lady that was at, at Vanity Fair who went to the New Yorker Tina Brown and, and Tina Brown then was the editor Tina Brown was the first person who let in photography at the New Yorker Tina's thing was if the words are great give it more space. If the photos are good, give it more space. She was uh, ambidextrous as far as, as that was concerned, or, or, or polyvalent, bivalent, whatever you want to call it. Um, and um, she went off 
You know, the, uh, I was only, she was only there for about a year, and then she went off with the, uh, uh, the guy who's in jail now, uh, of, of talk, uh, um, you know, got, uh, the movie producer guy. Thank you. Yeah, she went off with Weinstein to, to <laughs> found talk media. And so then, um, then the New Yorker, um, under a, a new head editor, uh, sort of was was given this new regime of photography, which they never had had previously. And I think it was a hard thing for him because he's a word person, but at least they were some good years of, um, and, um, I had no idea what the New Yorker was all about. Um, so I was sort of naive, in fact. Uh, how, um, and, but that being, being naive has a good aspect in that you're close to your heart. And I think um, that's one of the, th somehow, like, like Elizabeth was saying, I don't know how you do it, but I never get letters from, from readers asking where they can get a copy of the picture, okay? And I get this all the time. Um, and you mentioned, yeah, the first really interesting thing that I had to do for the New Yorker was Cuba, okay? Um, let me just say this, if I should say this, my wife said, don't talk about politics, but, um, I'm half French Canadian. Fidel Castro is loved by French Canadians because he got rid successfully of what they would call in Quebec Anglo-Saxon domination. So, and, and to this day, 40% of tourism on the island of Cuba are French Canadians. Okay, like we're not so much into the communism thing, but you know, like, no, hey, it's a good, like, it's cold in Quebec, you know, and you can get great beaches and stuff in Cuba, and the people are nice, so they get along, you know. Um, so I always wanted to go. In fact, when I lived in Paris, a bunch of times I was supposed to go, but it was always a hang up where it didn't work out. So finally, see, they uh, sent me there. So uh, you were mentioning earlier, yes. Yeah, the, so let's so, sorry, about, about Senora Faxes. Okay, this, mm -hmm. you won't believe this either. Like, um, Havana was in better shape in 97 than now. Because I, I went there in, the, in December of 97 because in the advance of the papal visit of January 1998. Okay, that was the, the lead-in for the New Yorker. Okay, that, so uh, I went there, and so I found one of those, uh, a driver of those old American cars, because he had um, my favorite American classic car, the 1957 Chevy. Though I liked the, the metal flake green, but he had the red one. I couldn't find a green one. So anyway, his name was Samuel. He was a really nice guy, and then, and then he, he got to see what it is I liked. And he said, this is uh, La Casa de la Loca. And he told me about, he's gonna bring it in Miramar. So he brought me there. And then he told me all about her, that her sons had escaped to the United States, but she was not even Cuban. She was from Galicia. No, no, sorry, from, um, um, uh, from Barcelona, from Catalonia. Okay, and she, um, Everyone knew of her. She had the, the Steinway piano, but she was an awful piano places. Make sure she doesn't play piano because it's, it, they couldn't stand to, to and, and she would force the people to listen to her piano playing. Okay. Um, and then I said to Samuel, I said, boy, this is a really great place. You really understood what I'm looking for. And says, I hope that I bring you good luck. You won't believe this. He won, he was one of the, they, they, the American embassy gives those, um, uh, by lottery, they give 10 of those, uh, you can go to the US, it's like in, in Monopoly, you pass go, you get the $200, you know. he got the visa, he got to go see, to the US, but he had to leave his car. I couldn't believe it. So, um, and he was so happy to leave. Um, okay, so uh, what can I say about Madame Faxis? Um, Yes, she did say 
she, her children, they wanted a better life. And I understand them because, you know, they wanted real work. And, you know, they, they, they were ambitious. Um, it's not going to work out being ambitious under the regime. And, and, you know, they, they're so well educated, you know, but uh, um, there's not, no jobs and stuff. Okay, so they left and, uh, and she was left all by herself. And Fidel always wanted that house because he had been there at some of those uh, um, social events because, you know, Fidel came from a very wealthy family. His father, um, his eldest brother was not even born in Cuba. He was born in Galicia. His father was a, a wealthy landowner near, uh, was it, near Guantanamo, all the way out there, like in the sticks, but they had a, a compound. I mean, a, 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 a finca, they call it, okay? Like, a, okay. One of the things yeah. that you, you say about her, and I wanted to ask you about this, that you, you said that she actually enjoyed seeing day by day the decay of the past she treasured. Yes. Yes, so she was, uh, but you know, she was like, when I met her, she was 88 already. So, you know, mm -hmm. I guess like, you know, you accept your, your age, you know, so that was part of it. But another thing, I am deathly afraid of dogs, okay? And like, she had three of those dashers, whatever, how, how you call them, you know? And like, they, they were just like, just like slurring, with big teeth, they're just ready to bite me. And she had to, to, to like tie them up in like in the kitchen, and it was like poop everywhere. It was like, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, it was frightening, you know? Um, and the whole time that I'm, I'm shooting, so, I, I said to the mice, like, are the dogs tied up? Uh, um, yes, all of that kind of stuff doesn't really translate in, in, like, in, into the pictures. You know, you don't really see that. Um, but um, I will say one, I mentioned this short story here because um, one of the things that I, I have a totally normal life and up to the moment where I get involved in photography, and then magic things happen, or out of this world things happen. Um, and, um, and that became like a kind of an addiction. It's like, you know, I hate to say it, guys, but it's better than drugs. It's like, because it's the real world doing it. It's just amazing. So I follow it, I call it sort of following signs. And it's like a way of being a medium. It's like, like the, I trusted this guy, Samuel. We were, and um, then I asked him kind of soul to soul, you see what I like, bring me to what I would like. And he did it. Uh, um, so he, um, and there's a kind of um, faith tra or transference. I don't know what to call it. Yes. So, and and I call that camera practice. It's all of the things that brings you to the picture. And I, um, so it's it's for me it's mediumistic. Um, I don't create. I try to have it come through me and mm -hmm. and I um, um, I'm, I think the other day in, or yesterday I mentioned about the Gayatri Mantra like you know I'm Catholic but it's the Gayatri I'll never be Hindu but it's my favorite prayer because you're basically asking the universe to show you where to go it's you're asking the universe to lead you so this is basically how I do it. And at the first part, you just try to like, I try to do the technical things properly because I'm not such a, I didn't start out as a great technician. Um, I never wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be a musician because I wanted, and when I came to the United States, I, I thought the greatest thing was rock and roll. I thought, I love all the American music traditions. I don't really like the visual arts here so much, but I love the music. I love the energy of it. And um, so I try to shoot like a musician, okay? And the other thing I say, when I make, I, my grandfather was a jeweler, and I make prints like, a, like jewelry. 
and they're two different aspects of me. Like, I'm not the same person when I shoot than when I do all the technical stuff, like with prints, which are actually done on computers, actually. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Photoshop. I, I, use, um, I did learn all of those, uh, what do you call them, um, the analog stuff before, but I, the best of my work is hybrid. I use mm -hmm. start with film, then I digitize. I, um, so I come from that generation of the hybrid, hybridization in between analog and digital. Uh, um, I see good and bad in both of the purities, you know? So I, I like, to, I try to use the best of all the worlds, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if... I, when you, um, so uh, th this photograph and many of the photographs that we've seen, oh, Yes, yeah. I wanted to make sure we saw her. And I love that portrait. Um, yeah. And that book is great because there are portraits, which strike yeah, me okay. as... I'm not, okay, I'm not so much known for, for, for portraits, mm -hmm. but I've done a lot of them. But yeah. let me just say one thing. Um, the work that I mostly exhibited in the United States um, is all things that I made with the view camera, which tend to be more of that, what I you know call emblematic, uh, st structure, but I've done a lot of work w um, when I did what I call location scouting. With the, I used to use a Pentax 6-7, which was a camera that uh, uh, paid for by the U.S. Army for Vietnam. It was like you know, it was um, um, 120 format, so it's a bigger negative. Um, and with that camera, I used to take a lot more of what I call uh, instantané or just like, you know, quick reaction shots. But I never showed so much of that work because I felt it was too French. And I didn't want the Americans <laughs> to see that, okay? Because I didn't think, yes. okay, so I didn't want to show them that, okay? So, um, but now I'm scanning yeah. it a lot. But I did do one book, I and I, which is just a quick sampler of, um, and I realized uh, when I did that book that I didn't know, I, I wasn't aware of it, but I mostly shot or took photographs of children throughout the world. And why? Because children are free in their expressions. Um, where adults, they're figuring out whether they like me or I like them. There's lots of ego stuff like in between, but I got better at doing, uh, Mm -hmm. So um, I realized to take the pictures of adults, I have to seem harmless and foolish. That disarms them. Okay, if I seem too mm -hmm. smart or this or that, then they don't like you and they, and they, and they shy away. And, I wanna, and another thing I want to say about that, okay, it was a recent dream that's very upsetting to me that uh, because the world has changed because of the, of the iPhones. Uh, uh, it used to be I could go and say, excuse me, may I take your portrait? And they either say yes or no. And, and I always ask them because I want to get eye contact. For me, without eye contact, it's worthless, okay? Because I'm, um, so I had this dream where I'm on this, it must have been like in Italy, near, near uh, Capri, one of those places, and I'm renting the boat, and I'm videoing the thing, and then we go around a cove, and there was like this big carpet with these three or four individuals. Uh, they were just gesticulating and stuff, and I'm trying to hear, so, see what they're saying, and I'm, I'm shooting it, and then the boat captain's, wait, 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 wait. He says, you gotta pay me. So what do you mean, I gotta pay? I paid you for the boat. So yeah, but uh, look. Uh, I'm paying for these actors here, you know? I mean, I, I have to pay them, you know? And, and then I woke up from, from then and I said, I realized that people uh, less and less are who they are, but they perform who they are. And this self-consciousness they got through the iPhones, okay? Uh, so it changed the consciousness level. Um, 
uh, and, uh, and, and, and in the woke America, like the, the only thing that, the, the only ethical photo now they, you can take in portraiture is one of yourself. They don't, um, looking at other people, other culture, other gender, whatever it is, is, is thought is not so kosher anymore. They don't allow this. There's some. It's a sort of of voyeurism, of privilege. It's seen as this, and I realize that, hmm. In a way, I did get old, and uh, and I found this very sort of disturb. Well, it's disturbing to get old, but sort of disturbing that I've lived past my um, the psychological regime that I used to live under. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, and I, I give you another example of this that uh, was, um, I had a conversation of, um, of war, of a young war photographer who was, uh, who took one of the pictures of, you know, the end, last days of Gaddafi, because I had been in Libya in 92 and stuff, so I was interested. Libya's a rough place. So, and he was saying to me that he used to have one of those uh, um, Canon cameras, but like, you know, the, the ISIS crowd type of guys would shoot at him. He could only take photos if he had an iPhone because that's what they used, okay? Mm-hmm. And the guys who got sort of Gaddafi at the end, you know, like they beat him up and they shot him up and stuff, but they were taking photos of, of his cadaver or him in his last moments of life with them filming it, okay? So that's, um, so we're, there's no more, the, the notion of the neutral observer is like, um, is not accepted anymore, okay? And that I've, hmm, I, I just had that dream like maybe like two months ago. And, uh, and it, it's also going through my, my archives and, uh, and, and, and scanning all of this uh, material that I never, that's too French, I didn't want to show it, so I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> scanning it now and I'm realizing that the um, social contract involved is of another era. Did you consider yourself a neutral observer when you were photographing interiors uh, in Havana or the Lower East Side of Manhattan or, uh, in, or in New Orleans? Yes. I used to think of myself as, a, as an amateur anthropologist. And, and this story I said three times yesterday, but I want to repeat it for this audience. This way of thinking came to me when I was a freshman in college, where I had to take a prerequisite of drawing class. I know that I draw really badly. Uh, Okay, but I had to take it anyway. And it was a big room with the, the, the nude model with some chairs and other props in the center. We had the easels had to draw it, okay? And like, and then we had a, a, a very curious, uh, this was in 68, um, a, a beatnik kind of, very tall beatnik kind of teacher with, with, with daddy Olingo. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and this was, okay. And they told me, this guy's from New York, you watch it, okay. So, um, um, and then he came up to me one day and then he said, Robert, he says, I know, I see you can do these kind of lines, but show me what you feel about the subject. And I thought, oh God, maybe I can't look. <laughs> maybe that's, that's how you draw what you feel, you can't look. And then I, after the class is over, it came to me in a flash. I don't care what I feel about the subject. That's, I care about how the subject feels about itself. Already, I wanted mediumship. Uh, and, and besides, what kind of life, they call this life drawing, where in life do naked women stand <laughs> like this, not moving, you know? Um, um, so, and then again, check this out, one day, I saw from 
afar, that, that woman walking across campus, I ran up to her and said, so, uh, excuse me, you know, I mean that, aren't you the woman who's in that drawing class? That is, yes, well, what of it? Well, you know, I'm, uh, some, I'm, I'm a student in there, and uh, like, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah, sure. Said, so what do you feel up there? She said, nothing. She said, I'm a single mother, you know, it's like, I'm not shy about my body. This is easy money for me. I'm thinking about my laundry list and something. I thought, see, I was right. There's no feelings going down, okay? Um, and then, I, uh, so the main concept here is how does the subject feel about itself? I wanted to, to get, like what the Muslims say, when you click that thing, you take their soul. I don't, I'm not interested in what I, I don't know what I feel about it, what I think. I don't think that's important. What I try to, receive them, okay? So that's with people, okay? With walls and interiors, okay? The concept there is, um, well, it gets to the Freudian notion of the superego. People put on walls who they think they are or who they want to be or how they, uh, how they want to be perceived as. So, um, you can take a portrait of somebody, say, oh, that person's like that, they're like that. You know a lot more about them when you see how they live. It's like, say, you speak to somebody you never met on the telephone, okay? And then, then you get an, an image of them, and then you meet them. They don't look like that, okay? So it's, for me, it's the same thing. Um, so for a, a long time, um, um, you know, I found that the psychological portraiture done of, of interiors was actually more deeply psychological. Um, and, and it looked like art, but yet it's, um, uh, it's psycho-emotive psycho data. Um, um, so it seemed for me to be a rich subject matter, okay? And then you're going to mention about the Art of Memory book. Yes, okay. Francis Yates, yeah. Art of Memory. Okay, I read this book in, in 1972. I was 21 years old, and it had a profound impact on me um, because, I mean, I knew I wanted to make art and stuff, but like most of the artists were doing this sort of non-representation, quote-unquote abstract art. And I mean, it looks okay, you know, like designs, like colored stuff, okay, but you know, it, um, it's like elevator music a little bit. You know, I felt, um, I, I, I liked iconography more. I mean, I did have that bent. And then when I read that book, I realized why iconography is greater because there's other psychological data that's encoded in there. And I realized, ha, huh. so th there is a, 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 um, a, a visual language that speaks to the soul because that's um, what the, the art of memory, uh, the, the mind remembers things that stand out of the ordinary way more than it re remembers the banal, the things that are all alike. So you, and to remember, the, and the, one of the things, the, the points the book makes uh, is that, to, to, strangely enough, to, to, to remember one thing, it's best to remember two, because then it reminds you of another thing, that reminds you of another thing, it reminds you of another thing. And then the, the whole, um, it's like a matrix that, that if you remember the image as, you, as it comes back to your consciousness, you can decode it again and get all, the, all of the meanings out. And I thought, ha, ah, I felt the message of the ancients, I thought to myself. Um, so, um, 
and, and yeah, and practitioners of the art of memory were they were made not to speak for two years at the, at the Pythagoras School in in Sicily, um, and they, they they were not allowed to speak, and they had to remember empty rooms and later put mm -hmm. um, out of the ordinary images in those so that uh, to, to make constructs. So it's basically empty room that they call locus, and then an agent of the imagination, which was the figures, okay? And I realized that the um, last uh, two, three years, I've been photographing a lot of, uh, uh, of Pompeian art or, or Roman, you know, pre-Christian Roman art, and that's what it is, and it came from the Greeks. In fact, I was mind blown that like, in Pompeii, the people didn't speak Latin, they spoke Greek. They were Greek speakers. Anyway, uh, okay, maybe I drifted off t t too much there, but, yeah, but that's the impact that that book had on me because I, I realized that one of the things that, that uh, representational imagery can do is contain psychological content mm -hmm. that affects the human being uh, soul. It seems to me also that one of the things that the book can help with is thinking about time and remembrance of things past. And one of the things that you've said is that, I mean, the, the connection with place is for me pretty clear in your work. Interior spaces, exterior spaces, you've called your, your, your work Habitat photography, and I really understand yeah, that. Yeah, because you know they, they always said I was an architectural photography photographer. That always upset me. You know, I've done maybe a half a percent of that kind of work, and I did it for for money when I needed money. You know, but um, architectural photography is product photography. It's advertising. You're trying to make it look good to sell it. I'm not interested in. What I'm interested in is how. Humans use architecture, and mm -hmm. uh, because it's it's the critical um, act, uh, like the way a society will use a building, it's the critical response to the building. Okay. Um, inherent in that is is the intent of usage, how it's used. Okay, so yeah. that so that's why why mm -hmm. I call it habitat mm -hmm. photography. Okay. Uh, yeah. And the usage takes place over time. And that's yes. one of the things I wanted to, to yes. ask you about is it seems to me that, again, the, 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 the relationship of, to place is pretty clear, but also the relationship of time in your work that, you know, you want to, I think, have to show change over time or some connection to time. Yes. And that's difficult in a still photograph, uh, well, which is, okay. you know, it's like maybe you leave the shutter open for four seconds, but you yeah. are, I think, not interested in necessarily in only in those four seconds, but the accumulation of time. Yes, okay. There, there's a great quote from a German photographer, Dieter Appelt. Uh, okay, I don't know it in German, but I know the English translation, where he says, uh, um, the instantané is a moment that will never reoccur. The, the long exposure is a moment that never occurred. Um, and um, okay, I like the idea of, um, it, it's a way of doing cinema. And the other thing I wanna say also about the notion of the room is that, um, you know, camera in Italian means room, okay? And um, because the, the, the camera obscura was a tiny little r room. In, in fact, some of the first ones you would walk in, okay? Uh, and it just was a pinhole. There was no uh, um, lens. Uh, I think the first reference, references to camera obscura is Chinese. Uh, Mao Tse, he was Cantonese. He was a, a, um, an anti-Confucianist. I always liked that because I don't like Confucius. I think, I think of him as a bourgeois philosopher. He's not my favorite at all. Um, uh, all his sayings and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's stuff my mom would say. Yeah. Yeah, look, look, I like my mom and stuff, but anyway. Uh, uh, it's trite. That's what I, you know. 
Um, so, um, and I like this notion that physics does it. I like the fact that, that the, the, the laws of the universe are inscribing the image. That to me is like great. It's like uh, you get to be like uh, the closest you get to, to be to, to the gods or something. Or like say in Catholicism, it's like, it's like, the, it's like the Holy Spirit bird who shows up at those kinds of, of moments where special things happen and then just leaves, you know? He doesn't get involved, mm -hmm. you know, he just gets mm -hmm. it. Okay, so, um, and I, okay, N another sort of decision that I made, which deals with geography and history, is that, uh, yeah, when I moved to Paris, I had, I said, well, you gotta take pictures of something why do you want to take the pictures up? So I thought, well, I want to take pictures of things that will no longer exist because I figure sooner or later, mm -hmm. they'll want to buy them because I had so little money. I thought, this is bound maybe to work. Um, now, and I want to mention this also because this also happened to me uh, during the COVID period that I... Okay, um, I think in 1999, I went to like Cairo, I went to, uh, to Alexandria, and then Cairo. And I have lots of stories about stuff in Egypt, okay? But, um, uh, see, can I digress and tell you a story about, okay, <laughs> listen to this one. Like, so, I'm not gonna say no. Okay, so uh, <laughs> the minute you go on the street in Egypt, you get arrested, but they're nice cops. They don't beat you up or anything, but you need to have the permission of, of the Ministry of Television. So I had to drive all the way to Cairo. And then they brought me to this place. And then, see, they saw, uh, then I traveled, um, I didn't, that's before I had my American citizenship, but like it says in my French passport, I, I'm born in Canada, so they, they are looking at this. So then they got me this minder guy who had lived in Canada. Listen to this story. So he, this is like the, the, the facts, all the stuff in the back that makes, makes the picture. So mm -hmm. He had been um, a, a young chess champion. And then he, the first time he left Egypt, he had the, the, it was a big chess meet in, um, in, uh, in Nova Scotia. So he went to Nova Scotia, and then his unfortunate luck of the draw, his first opponent was Russian, who beat the pants off of him. He was so humiliated, he didn't want to go back to Egypt, so he delivered pizzas in, 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 uh, in, in Nova Scotia for like something like 10 years, okay? Then, then his mother was dying, he was called back. So then, and so, since he knew English so well and stuff, and then uh, he got the job being a minder for, for, for the Ministry of, of Television. So I said, this is, so where do you want to go? I said, well, I want to go to that city of the dead that I read about. He says, oh, really? I said, yeah. I said, okay. So then I go there, and, and the City of the Dead, it was like it's Muslim mausoleums, 17th, 18th century, okay? And, uh, and there, some of them are really big. They're like, you know, uh, almost houses, and poor live in there, like homeless types. They were mostly elderly. And some of them are like, you know, a, a bit nuts and stuff. So... And then I was taking a picture, and some guy comes at me and starts yelling. And then I said, so what did he say? Oh, I don't want to tell you. I said, well, come on, tell me. He said, well, he said, he said, well, he said, look, why do you let him with that yellow hair? Because like, um, like Arabs don't say blonde hair, they call it yellow hair. You know, him with the yellow hair, click that thing. Don't you know when it clicks, it takes our soul, and he's not paying. Okay. All right, so it's a sort of a lead up to they have to pay for everything. Um, okay, so maybe four or five months ago, I'm reading in the New York Times that the present government of Egypt doesn't like the city of the dead. So they're going to build a big highway overpass and they're gonna destroy all those mausoleums and stuff just to get rid of that eyesore and all those people. You know, I finished most of the article, I was reading it online, and actually tears came to my eyes, and I thought, you know what, man? You gotta watch out what you, 
want because it can come true. And I realized that it's not going to exist anymore. That, that also is gone. I was right. And now I'm afraid of all the things that I want because um, uh, they, when they come about, then it ends. Okay? So, um, but yes, that was my idea, was to take, I thought I could have historical documents that are done in an aesthetically intelligent way. That's what I wanted to, I thought, try that. And I did try that. But I think that time is also coming to an end. Historical documents in an aesthetically pleasing way that, yes. it's, which I think does describe your work in a nutshell very, yeah. very well. Uh, uh, um, yeah, because most of most of the real anthropologists they take really bad photos. <laughs> okay, really. Yeah. Okay. So I do want to make sure we um, uh, do we leave a, a bit of time for audience. But oh, before, okay. before we have q and I'd like to hear a little bit from you about New Orleans oh, yeah. and Katrina. Okay. Um, and I, I did ask um, that we had up here uh, Robert's book, After the Flood, which if you've not seen, it might be the heaviest book I've ever held. I have uh, heavier one. It's but. it's really it's really an astonishing book. Um, a couple of things. One is, and I would like to hear about your experience of publishing this with Steidel, yeah. which for the photo people in the room, you know, is the world's premier photo book publisher. Um, it's a it's a real experience to publish with with Steidel. Um, I believe most all of your books are with Steidel, including yeah. this this one. Yes. Um, so I'd like to hear a bit about sort of what okay. that was okay. like. I'll go quickly. I try to not to have too much extra. But then I do want I do yeah, want to okay. hear about these okay. um, that experience. Okay. I went to high school in in in, in New Orleans. Okay, um, I would say of all the places I lived in, in the United States, uh, New York and New Orleans are my favorite. Okay, they're different, all right. But um, uh, so I was 13 when we first got there. Uh, and you know, like um, there's only one one public high school, or then in, in all of New Orleans, it was all like Catholic schools, and they were like uh, in high school or gender segregated. So I went to one that was called at that time Coriezu, which became Brother Martin, because I actually knew Hermano Martin. You know, he had a big impact on my life. You know, I I learned Spanish from him, um, and, uh, all this stuff. That, so it. Um, and, uh, you know, it had an impact on me. And um, uh, by the way, that that article that you saw in, in the New Yorker, with, uh, okay, like you know, it does. You can't find it online anymore because uh, the the present editor had a big blowout. See, with the writer of, of that uh, article, so it's not even on there. Uh, you can't if you have it on paper. That's the only way that you'll ever see it. But anyway, that's that's an aside. Um, Is that Dan Baum? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He got in a big hassle with. Uh, yeah. mm. Okay. Um, okay, that's unfortunate. Uh, um, okay, it was hard. the The logistics were hard. I'm not gonna go. I, I could go on long, but let's say we rented. A, a car, a, um, a Jeep kind of truck or whatever you call them, in SUV thing in um, in Baton Rouge. Okay, when, when we go to near the flood places, okay, you could make it maybe a block or two. And then the clay that adheres to the, the, the tires and gets stuck in the wheel well gets uh, that after, you're not advancing, it's just stuck. So we have to go and scrape out all of the wheels, all the clay, it's like clay. It's like really gummy, sticky clay. And, and then and maybe work our way through another block. Okay, it would take a long time. And plus, 
um, the, the stench was incredibly bad. I mean, like you saw the pictures in here of where uh, there's a, the tape on the refrigerators. You open that refrigerator door, guys, you die. Okay? You faint. We're talking some real biological heavy-duty rot. Okay? Um, and... Um, and like when I used to, uh, most of the people who were around uh, lived at the Sheraton. You know, we just, uh, I had four people to a room. Um, and I, I would get a, a, a towel and just impregnate, you see me, I keep um, cologne and breathe through it. My, my assistants would help me set up the inside shots, and then just leave. You can only barf so many times a day. After a while, you can't take it anymore. You get pains, okay? So, and, um, and I used, um, they're like maybe five to 10 minute exposures. It was really dark wow. in there, dark. Um, you wouldn't know that from the photographs. No, you don't. You, you, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. to, to take, uh, there's so many mm -hmm. stories in back of taking the pictures that, uh, mm -hmm. which don't come, but none of that, bothers me. Um, um, what, um, okay, I consider this book, it's, it's my only real American book, number one. Number two, um, okay, I was sent down there for a week. I worked six months. Uh, and um, I found, uh, okay, I wanted the book to be of the same proportion as the as, as the the amplitude of the devastation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yeah. the book could be, I have enough material that could be twice this long. But Steidl said, "Look, it's going to fall apart." <laughs> okay, <laughs> so um, um, the most hurtful part was when. Um, Steidel set up, um, he knew somebody at the Corcoran in D.C. And, and, and the, the release, the public release of the book was at the a Corcoran Museum. It now belongs to another museum. But anyway, um, I, don't, I really don't know much about Washington. I should have known how, what a political town. That's what they say on TV. They're not kidding. Um, and the people... There, most of the people, they wanted me to say that it was all George Bush's fault. And I said, well, uh, I lived in Louisiana. Both parties are corrupt. Uh, Clinton being there, it would have been the same. But they got really mad. They all walked out, or many walked out. I shouldn't say all, like half, a lot. You know, it was like, Whoa, and I was getting all this stuff in the press about how it was ethically wrong for me to make other people's suffering look beautiful because by doing this desensitizes the, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the proper political blame or something like that, okay? And that, um, and it, it minimizes their pain, okay? And, and, and where are the people? Well, first of all, uh, I looked up, it was like uh, on, on uh, August 27th, an emergency decree was, uh, that was four days after the storm. So nobody, you can't live in a town that's flooded, there's no electricity, there's no sewage and no gas. Like, you're not gonna make it. Everybody left. There were no, no people. And one of the things that they don't realize about a lot of the photos is that they show traces that the residents came back and basically went through all their stuff to see what they could salvage. The only salvageable stuff was either ceramic or metal. Every, uh, and, and one of the, a lot of the photos show that a lot of the residents would go through and pick photographs that they try to dry out on, on surfaces because that's all they had left were their memories. So I see the photos like kind of like um, 
like a kind of extreme unction or last rites for the trajectory of people's lives. Hey, most of the people didn't die, but the, the, that trajectory of their life did. They were, they, they be, uh, um, okay? So these are, are sort of testaments to what's left, like when the, the snakes shed skins and stuff, you know? It's like, mm -hmm. it's what was left. And that's what I was trying to commemorate. I, I thought, this is a commemoration of those people and those lives. Um, uh, and it took me years and years to get over it, okay? But so I got a lot of, I mean, to get over that criticism, okay? I, and, and the Chernobyl book, I didn't get any of this stuff here, but one time I was in, in Paris Photo where it's some, um, a Ukrainian lady who was like uh, Russian. She got so mad, she wanted the, those, those pictures to be sort of taken, you're picking the worst things of Ukraine, and, 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 and. so it's only when it affects your culture do you take offense. When it's somebody else's, you don't care, you know, then you, 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 there's a distance from it. So I had to think about that for a while, what mm, the implications mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, the ethical and moral like implications of taking those photographs that Unfortunately, after the fact, because when I took them, for good or bad, I had no guilt. I didn't feel, I thought I was doing a good thing, okay? Mm -hmm. I didn't feel that guilt. Um, but maybe that's like the beginning of this, um, of that you can only take a picture of your own self philosophy, mm -hmm. okay? Only I didn't recognize it as such mm -hmm. then. And that, and that what's really, people are looking at are the political implications of the photographs and not their psychological implications. So that hurt me, or that, hurt, first it hurt me, then it took me for a, a mental spin. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, okay. You've also talked about, with regard to the Chernobyl work, how difficult that was for you emotionally to see, because you went back, Gosh, was it like six years after the... Uh, let's say, no, it was 86, I went in yeah. 2001. So that's 15... Oh gosh, yeah. 15 years. And looks like things were just sort of left. Oh yeah, they, they, were, were. they were mostly left. Yeah, Okay. Yeah. And you did, you have talked about the toll that that experience I took on you. I got sick from there, but the food's just so bad. That I, I, had, I thought I had a radiation sort of poisoning, but no, I had E. histolytica amoeba, which is from mm -hmm. uncooked pork. Okay, and that's painful, by the way. I mean, uh, it took me a long time to track that one down. Um, some of us, it's not so funny, okay? <laughs> I, I didn't enjoy that, but, um, and, um, um, why did I find it, so, okay. Um, there's something about that, the brutality of that part of the world that, I can't take, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I've been, I only went back once to Russia, because unfortunately I do consider Ukraine part of Russia, I'm sorry, or they're like, you know, it's like US and Canada or something. They're like brothers. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a difference, okay. I, I said this also, like a, speaking of a, a Texan, George Bush, when he had the, the Gulf War and he wanted Jean Chrétien to go and participate. And he wouldn't do it and he was pissed. And this is on Canadian TV. And then he said, so, Jean, uh, Jean, what's the difference between the United States and Canada? And Jean says, oh, it's easy, my friend Georges. He says, um, when you come to Canada, you don't have to give up your prior identity and there's no new propaganda to believe in. Now, wow. Man, and I just roll that and say, wow, check that out. Okay, and George Bush, he didn't know what to say. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, but yes, I only went back to Russia once and um, I have a, a, a philosophy, if you don't get along with the people, don't go there. 
okay? I'm doing them a favor. And there's great photos to take there, but I'm not the person to do it. So you have to know your limits. Um, okay. Let's, okay, let's move on. Uh, uh, you want to ask about, well, we spoke about Havana. Well, I think this might be a good time actually for um, Q&A, okay. if there's any, yeah. and I believe yeah. that Don yeah, will we've got a cover that. floating around somewhere. Uh, if there's anything so from the audience. If um, anyone have any, any questions? Oh, yes. What format? What size film are you shooting? Okay. Well, um, okay. In my life, I hardly ever use 35 millimeter film except for movies. In a view camera. In a view camera, I started out in four by five, and then I did eight by ten, and then uh, some stuff I did in five by seven because I found it to be it's like almost twice the resolution and it's barely. 20% more weight, okay, so I found that. And then I did recently, or recent last 15 years, 11 by, by 14, which is a lot of weight, a lot of different lenses, but just a, an amazing, um, and it's a two-man operation. I can't do it all by myself, okay? Uh, and, and a lot of the work that, like the city's work that he was referring to, what I call the auto-constructed cities, all the places in Mumbai, all, um, and, and the favelas in, in Rio, and, uh, and, and the shanty towns like in, in Africa. Um, I did that in 11 by, by 14, because there's so many houses. I wanted to make big prints to see all, all the detail. Um, I recently used a digital camera because uh, it, I can be, f I'm old and I can be free again and don't have to carry a whole lot of weight. But the thing about it is I can get great medium shot, uh, medium sort of distance shots, great sort of telephoto stuff. It's bad for um, you know, what I, uh, wide angle sort of corrected sort of perspective, what I call the, the cathedral interior shots. So I'm back to using film for those types of images because I don't get this, I haven't figured out the, how to get the look that I want for those wide angle shots in digital. And, I, and, and having studied what makes the digital sensor and stuff, I don't think it'll ever happen because of the nature of the sensor itself. Well, They're like little cups. You're accustomed to, to moving the lens up and down. Yeah, and, and, and the swings. Against the film plate. Yeah. yeah, okay. And I just, I must say, I love that. <laughs> okay, um, so, uh, okay. Um, but, you know, having, um, I did maybe seven, eight years of 11 by, by, by 14 inch work, and then, you know, it, First, it's expensive, because right? I have to take another person with me. Everything's a big deal, and it's expensive. And it takes time, and I like that kind of distancing, because the, the work gets more sort of photographic. But I've ha since I did this archive thing, I had the need to go back to doing work that I did in my early 20s when I was all by myself, no tripod, just handheld. And I just did a book for Dior with a, with a, um, a digital camera, though it was on a tripod. Um, and I just love the freedom, but now I'm getting back to the point saying, I love the freedom, I love it all. But it has some, some um, renaissance perspective things that you can't get uh, in, in digital. So, and now I'm feeling the need to, to do that again. It's your anchor. Yes. It holds you down. Uh, um, it holds earth. Oh, yeah. Is that what it is? Uh, it, it, okay. I don't know if it holds me down see, to the earth, but it, 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 it's, it's better grammar. It's a better pictorial grammar. That's what I like about it. Uh, that, um, like I said, th those real anthropologists, they take crappy photos. Okay? The, but when you use the view camera, it, the, it's, like, it's grammatically well um, uh, presented. 
Okay, so and I've missed, now I'm missing that again. So you must be a photographer. Yeah. Okay, and you use a view camera too? I have. Yeah. The 11 by 14 format, that must be a problem. Uh, yes, um, but like, but I, it, to do it correctly, I need another, I can't even focus with the front. Yeah. I say I need another person, yeah. So when you use an 11 by 14 camera, yeah. do you consider all the work that you produce off of that solely your intellectual property? Uh, yeah. Why, I just, why, I don't know why should I not? I mean, I'm curious. I just never used 11 by 14. Well, I mean, uh, it's the same, uh, like, it's just sort of technically more involved, but it, it, it's the same principle. Same as 4 by 5 same principle. Yeah, yes. You get to observe your... Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think it's... A, it, it, it's only a physical difference. It's not a, it's not a theoretical or difference. It's not another thing. It's just a bigger of the same thing. Okay, I want to thank everyone for being here. We've got one. Oh, one well, guest, please. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, gosh, I have a lot of questions. I'll just yeah. ask one. Um, yeah. What for you is is there a relationship to painting and photography in 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 your work as it pertains to the importance of resolution and detail and scale? Okay. Um, okay. I. Uh, I like, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, though I love color, but I like uh, what's known as representational art, okay? Because I, I like seeing icons. Maybe I should say I like icons. Okay, so um, there's a lot of painters that I like. Um, back to this French art thing, you know, I, I, most of the painters that I like happen to be French, okay, um, or Italian, okay. Um, uh, in, in certain, I like the paintings of Jean-Louis David, okay. I like that sort of historical, like that that re-digesting of history, and I like the double layers. It's like when. Um, um, when he from the 18th century is revisiting uh, the second century BC, there's a kind of, uh, of temporal displacement there that I like, okay? Um, because I do, one of the, I, I'm also, I like, you know, I don't think I've, ever read any novel in my whole life, you know, but I only read historical things. Like, uh, besides The Art of Memory, one of the books that uh, has touched me the most, maybe you know this book, it's like by, by Bernal Diaz del Castillo, the, the, the History of the Conquest of New Spain. Okay, you ever read this book? This is the most incredible eyewitness account book you can imagine. So, so this anyway, I'm not, I'm, these are the kind of books that I read. I basically eat the past. Okay, this is what I do. I, I, I use this as food. I, I, yeah, and here's another thing too that I should have mentioned. Back to the, I don't, it, it doesn't matter to me what I feel. Like there's no feelings involved. You have to load, you have to preload feelings before before I even shoot, and that's what I do with all this, this time eating stuff. When you take the photo, I have to almost be absent, okay? Like, that's what good astrologers do. Like, they do the worst readings for people they know. Like, don't let your personal stuff get into it. That's not how to be a good medium, okay? So, but, but your, your feelings are, are encoded in you in a non-conscious reactive way, okay? And the other time to have the feelings is when you look at what you've done. Say, like you, you take the picture, 
What you take the picture of is the question, and, and, and the picture you get is the data to analyze. And that you should have the feelings about. I like, I get the feelings, okay? And then, but when you shoot, like imagine if you go to a surgeon, like, and you have a, 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 a very intense, like, like, like operation, he's gonna have feelings when he's doing that, man. You're, you're not gonna come out of that very well. He, he has, you have to be, you know, very, um, he, he has to be outside of himself just performing a task, not being his emotional, it has to be non-conscious, okay? This is a, um, okay, anyway, this is the rule that I use. Uh, so how does that relate to, to, to painting? Um, uh, uh, because- I guess I meant the grammar, you know, when, when you talk about the grammar of a photograph. Oh yeah, well, that, I get that from, from Renaissance, perspective, okay? Uh, that was one of the things also, like that um, w when I was going to, to art school in those years in the 60s, all these artists, they were always speaking about that, how they wanted to um, go against the laws of, of Renaissance sort of perspective. And I thought, why do they even want to do that? Like, what's the, uh, like, uh, uh, why don't we make square wheels? Like what, why, yeah, like why, you know, why, um, I, I'm not into like having, a, just for the, I'm not, um, uh, what do you call it, a, a nihilist. Uh, I'm not into nihilism and, and denial just for the sake of denial. Uh, I'll use whatever works, okay? So, um, and, and to me, uh, the Renaissance sort of perspective is the, uh, that's how the images look good, right? Well, I think we're going to stop it right stop here, here because we're going to lose okay. our caterers and okay, we okay, want to make okay. sure oh. that everyone has something to eat. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, let, me say, let me say how pleased I am and honored, Robert, that you we're going to consider you part of the Briscoe family now, okay? Now, you, may, you have a big family. You already have a big family, but yeah. you have a bigger family now. So... Thank you for coming here, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you come back. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm very um, honored and happy that uh, I'm in your, your, your collection. Okay, and I really like your off-site thing. That was amazing. Okay. Storage yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but yeah, yeah. It's very cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Steve, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>